Thanks for tuning into our podcast. We love having you here, and it's our mission to bring you all the latest and greatest tips, skills, and know-how to make you the best that you can be. We know that you have it in you, and we're going to show you how. Now, now, let's get started. Good morning, guys. It is May 20th, 2019. If you don't know, my name is Gary Johnson, and I thank you for listening to 100% Forgive and Exalting Truth, no matter the cost. I'm always going to say it. The purpose of this podcast is to exalt Jesus in every way possible. Today is May 20th, and if you guys don't know what that means to me, here's what it means. Today is my two-year anniversary with my wife. She's the most perfect, beautiful woman on the planet, and I love you if you're listening to this. There is no other woman on the planet for me except you. Laura Johnson is her name. Originally, Laura Wesley. However, May 20, 2017 was the day that changed. So, I want to tell you, I love you publicly. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me, including our children, and I appreciate you so much. You are so faithful. You're kind. You are generous, and you are honestly the sweetest person I've ever met in my life. And no one, and I mean absolutely no one, could ever take your place. You have a specific spot in my heart that no one could ever have. In fact, you have my whole heart. I don't know how Jeremiah and Emily will feel about that. Our children, me saying that, because they have specific parts of my heart as well. However, you know what I mean. I love you and there's no one on the planet except for you, for me. So you're my other half, you're perfect, you're exactly who I wanted in life, and God answered my prayer, definitely. Today's topic is the glory of God. I have not really talked about this a lot outside of this podcast with anyone, really. In fact, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that I never really study this topic, even though it's such an important topic, I believe. And there's many times when I'm reading the Bible, I will see people talk about the glory of God. I will see Scripture expound on the glory of God. And maybe you haven't really studied on that as well. So if you haven't, hopefully you and I can both benefit from this. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me answers. Look them up on Google. We can pretty much do anything today with the Internet. So, the glory of God. Um, The Bible is pretty clear that all things were made for the glory of God. And the glory of God is a big topic in the Bible. So, I want to hit a couple articles. DesiringGod.com, if you don't know who this website is pretty much about, there's a pastor named John Piper. And I'm pretty sure his church is located around uh, California. It may not be in California. may only be in some other part close to there, maybe Arizona, I don't know. But DesiringGod.com, 12 Ways to Glorify God at Work. So, the article starts out saying, Mark Twain once said, "Work Work is a necessary evil to be avoided. Although there may be days when we feel like we he got it right, we know God has ordained work as a stewardship of His created world. If you go back to Genesis 1, verse 28, you'll see that before the fall, before anything went south, before the sin of Adam and Eve actually occurred, Adam was working. That was a God-given duty given to Adam. So work is a natural part of God's plan for us. God has designed work for His glory and for our good. But how might we glorify God at work? This list is not exhaustive, But here's at least 12 ways. So if you have a pen or a piece of paper, or if you just want to listen, go right ahead. Write them down. Or you can just visit this website again. It's www.desiringgod.org. I believe the slash is two ways to glorify God at work. So number one, 
believe that all legitimate work is holy or unholy before God based on our faith, not the nature of work itself. (laughs) The scripture, he quotes, But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So, even though there's a context to this, if you read Romans 14, there is a context. Christians were disagreeing about eating certain foods and keeping certain days, uh, treating certain days as holier than others. Now, you have to understand the audience that Paul is speaking to. You had Jewish people, you had Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians living with each other, actually assembling with one another. And if you don't know anything about Jewish history or Gentile history, Jews really did not associate with Gentiles. Um, they Gentiles, us non-Jewish people, were kind of looked at as filthy and you know unholy. We weren't God's chosen people. So they kind of stayed away from each other, especially Samaritans. The Jews did not like the Samaritans. And when you read the Bible, if you've read the story about Jesus going to the Samaritan woman, um, that was uncommon, especially going to a woman in that time. But again, Romans fourteen twenty three, whoever doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not of faith from faith. So the principle we can take from that is our work. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So when we do our work, when we work, if we're not working from faith for the glory of God, John Piper's using this principle of saying, you know, whatever from is not from faith is sin. You can agree or disagree with that. Point two, be just and honest in all your dealings with money. And Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So God desires honesty. He desires truth. And if you're a cashier, if you work at a bank, if you're a teller, if you just deal with money, or if you don't deal with money, this can just be applied to being fair with certain things, specifically money in this case. Be be just and honest and deal with your money in an honest way. Deal with your work in an honest manner. Point three, be prayerfully dependent upon God, pouring contempt on self-sufficiency. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, pray without ceasing. I don't know if you guys pray a lot. There have been many times in my personal walk where I just don't feel like talking to God. I got so much going on in my life and sometimes I don't, I feel like I don't, I shouldn't bother God with my problems and then that therefore leads to not actually doing that, not giving him my problems, even though he wants me to do that. Now that I'm a father, it's different for me um, how I look at God. And if you're not a father, if you're not a mother, um, maybe you can't relate as much on this. Maybe you can. But as a father, I desire for my children to have a relationship with me. I desire for them to want to have a relationship with me. I desire for them to want to talk to me. If they have any problems, I want them to be able to bring them to me. Now, even though they're little right now and they don't really understand what life is or what's going on, they do know who mommy is and they do know who daddy is and they do know who their grandma and grandpas are. But I want them to come to me. How much more does God want his own children to come to him? I know that sometimes we look at God as, you know, the sovereign ruler of the earth, which he is. However, I think we look at him in a way that, that kind of is not true. That God looks down on us with his nose stuck up in the air, waiting for you to mess up so he can strike you down and hold you accountable on Judgment Day. That's not how God is. That is that is not how God d- works. That is not how, that's just morally who he is not. So another scripture John quotes is Psalm 127, 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it in labor, Those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Point four. Use the wages earned by your work to provide for and bless others. 1 Timothy 5.8 But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially members of his own household, he has denied the faith faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So if you're a father, 
and you're not providing for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever, according to Paul, according to the Holy Spirit, according to God himself, you're worse than an unbeliever. If you're not providing for your relatives, you're worse than an unbeliever. Say you have someone who is a widow in your family. Those who are children of the widow should support and help their mother, their um, or if their father's a widower, that may be the right name, I'm not sure, they're to help him out. However, if they can't do that, then we as brothers and sisters in Christ should take that role and help the widow, and um, we should be willing to do that. Now, that's the spiritual sense, but for physical family genetic relationships, we should be willing to help our family out all the time. All the time. There should be no problem with that. And I just did a lesson on uh, no church tithing is not required. It is not required. There's no commandment that commands Christians to give 10% of their money on Sunday or at any church service. There's just no command for that. However, I did make the point that that does not mean that we are to be selfish. That does not mean that we are to just hold our money to ourselves. We should help those in need, and especially if we have families. We are to take care of them. We are to provide for them, and there's no question to that. Another scripture, Ephesians 4, 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So just be an honest person. When you come to work, work hard. Do your job. Then you will you will receive a check, you will receive money of which you earned, and share that money with those in need. Provide for your family. Yes, save up, save up for the future. However, always be generous with your finances and with your food and with your clothes. Point five, grow in your skill. Set, work hard, and strive for excellence. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. Do you see a man skillful, skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Proverbs 14.23 In all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. So in other words, walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. Matthew 5.16 In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So... So far, we've listed five points. All of these you can do bring glory to God. But Matthew 5.16 specifically says, Jesus talking, Let your light shine before others, so that people may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So when you do good works, when you work hard, when you are honest, when you are you know, just in your dealings with people and with money and what, everything, these little things, even though they may not seem like big things to us, these bring glory to God. Point six. Exemplify love for your neighbor and how you interact with your colleagues. 1 Corinthians sixteen fourteen. Let all that you do be done in love. Now, there's a lot of times in my life where I know that I have not done everything that I've done in love. This, Paul, the apostle, is instructing me to do otherwise. Do everything in love. I encourage you to check out 1 Corinthians 13, starting with verse 8, on what love is. Point seven, plan ahead and sincerely preface future tasks if, quote, if God wills, end quote. Proverbs twenty four twenty seven. prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. Doing this, saving for the future, being wise with your finances brings glory to God. Again, this may be something little to us, it may seem little to us, but these little things that we do bring glory to God. And I need to say that without the Holy Spirit helping you, without the Holy Spirit being with you, you really can't bring glory to God. Remember, he who began a good work in you will finish it. That's what the scriptures say. Um, James four thirteen fifteen. Come now, you who say, quote, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit, end quote. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, quote, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. End quote. This scripture has this scripture changed my outlook on life. I do my very best. Sometimes I'm very bad at it, but I, I try to do my best at saying, you know, 
if the Lord wills, we were do we will do this or that because I have to understand um, that God is in control. God literally knows the number of my days. He's playing my days out. Um, my life is in His hands. He knows what I'm going to say before I say. It. He knows what I'm going to do before I do it. That applies to you as well. But the fact of the matter is, our life truly is but a vapor. If you have ever boiled water, you see the mist come out of the water. It's there for a second, then it's gone the next. That's exactly how our life is. Just yesterday, feels like I was seven years old. Just yesterday, it feels like Jeremiah, my son, and my, and Malia, my daughter, they were just born. Jeremiah will be two next week. <clears throat> Actually, this week. <coughs> they grow up fast. But the point is that if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And when we have that outlook on life, it brings glory to our God. Point eight, speak the gospel to your colleagues. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Sometimes it may be hard to talk about Jesus with your colleagues. I know it is for me sometimes because I work night shift. I work, I work by myself and I have clients I had to work with um, who have specific disabilities and issues. However, um, I don't interact with colleagues a lot on this job. But the little things that I do, I hope bring glory to Christ. Now, now I know I'm not always perfect at that. And I'm sure you can relate to this. Isn't it interesting how when we desire to talk about Jesus, it's like there's something holding our tongue back? Um, maybe that's the fear of being rejected. Maybe that's the human nature of wanting to be accepted and not rejected by people. Maybe Satan has a plan that I know that really we are at war with spiritual forces that we can't see as Christians. So maybe we can all pray for each other in that area that if God wants us to speak about the Lord, give us boldness to do that. And by doing that, we bring Glory to God. Point nine, work as t- unto the Lord and as unto men. Colossians three twenty three to 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, literally that means whatever you do, do it for the Lord. Do it with all of your heart. Don't do it for men. All of us who have a job, who don't own a business, we all have a boss. We're not our own boss. We answer to somebody. However, we are not to look to that person as if they are our main boss that we answer to. We answer to God. God is our Father. And everything we do, we ultimately do it for God and not people. So if your boss tries to get you to lie by signing something, signing a piece of paper, saying that you did something when you didn't do it, that is when you have to choose to obey God rather than to obey them. So And do it with all of your heart. Do it definitely with all of your heart. Point 10. Focus on the work you've been given. Proverbs twenty-eight nineteen. Whoever works... His land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. So making sure you're not lazy. It's easy to become lazy. Um, If you've ever read the proverb of the ant, the ant during the summer gets all their food. They store up what they need. They work really hard at it. If you ever have seen a pile of ants um, do their job, I mean, they work really hard. You'll you'll see them carry stuff that's 10 times bigger than them. But they're determined because they know winter is coming and they want to be sure that they have what they need. But doing this brings glory to God. Again, this this is all about the glory of God. Point 10, focus on the work you've been given. I actually just said point 10. Point 11, speak words of grace. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as this, as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So easy 
to get upset sometimes and to say something you regret. All of us have done it, and we're not alone in this. But the Christian, the conduct of a Christian, words come. the words that come out of our mouth are to bring peace, are to bring happiness. They're to, they're to build people up. So controlling the tongue is such a hard thing. If you've read James 4, I believe that's where it talks about the tongue. It gives life and it gives death. If you say the wrong word to someone, that can impact them so much to where they take their own life. If you tell, I remember listening to something on the news where one kid, I think it was a girl, told this boy to go kill himself. And he did that. I think he was bullied. I'm not for sure. However, those very words that she said pushed that boy to the point of killing himself. And I'm pretty sure she got in legal trouble for that. And last point, point 12, rest in your justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Galatians 2.16, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have all so have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I got to emphasize that so much. This is one of the reasons why Galatians is one of my favorite books. We get, we have to come to an understanding, and I'm talking to me more specifically because here lately, even though I know what the Bible says, it's like my emotions Don't want to agree with what the Bible says. I know that I'm justified by faith in Jesus Christ apart from my works. Any work that I do, because no work that I do, according to Galatians 2.16, will ever justify me. No works of the law, no work that I do, could ever justify me. It's only by faith in Christ. This righteousness that has been applied to me, it's not my own. It's through Christ. I cannot obtain this righteousness that I stand in. I cannot obtain this grace that I stand in. You cannot obtain the grace and the justification that you stand in. God has done this. So it's so, but it's it's crazy how it's so easy to fall back into the pattern of thinking that God looks at you and, and treats you a certain way according to what you do. He who began a good work in you will finish it. Jesus is the author and the perfecter and finisher of our faith. That's what the scriptures say. So we need what what we need to do, what I need to do, is when we're tempted to think that God's viewing us by how we are, current where our current state is with him, say we're struggling in a specific area. We need to train ourselves to think the way that God thinks about us. He views us through Christ, what Christ has done. Christ died for you. He canceled out your debt. You as a Christian, He has done that. And if you're not a Christian, He will do the exact same thing for you. It's my prayer that you come to Him. It's my prayer that you will consider Jesus. You know what? I encourage you, if you're not a Christian... Call out to God. Show, tell, ask Him, tell Him to, to show Himself to you. I have confidence that He will in some way. And while you're waiting, do some research on Christianity. Do some historical research on Christianity. Visit people like William Lane Craig, Frank Turek, people, apologetics, Rabbi Zacharias, people who are very wise and smart, in this area, and also challenge evolution. But it's so easy to fall back into the pattern of thinking that you're justified by what you do, that somehow you maintain your relationship with God by what you do when that's not the case. Now, this is about the glory of God, and those were just 12 ways to glorify God at work. So another thing, I don't know if you guys ever thought about this, but repentance. So repentance, biblically, is a change of mind to change your mind about your sin and to turn away from it. When you change your mind about your sin, ultimately you will turn away with it. You will have a disgust for it. You will be burdened by your sin. Now, I'm not saying you will be burdened to such a level that you always have to meet that level every time you fall into sin. Um, But sometimes 
I think that what I do brings the most glory to God. Now, I know what Jesus did brings the ultimate glory to God. However, when I focus on my conduct, when I focus on how I'm to live for God, I do know that these things bring glory to God when I do them. However, do you know what brings God more glory? When you get to the point of your spiritual walk, will you find yourself with a thorn in your side? When you find yourself struggling, when you find yourself not being able to do all the things that you want to do, when you find yourself at war with yourself and you're failing to do what God wants you to do, and then you call out to God, when you find yourself calling out to God saying, God, I can't do it. I cannot save myself. Please, Father, please, Lord. Just as Peter reached his hand up to Jesus and needed help when he fell into the water. Do you remember what Jesus said to him? He said, oh, you of little faith. But he didn't just stop there. Jesus reached his hand down in the water as Peter was drowning in his lack of faith. Peter reached his hand up. Jesus reached his down and pulled him right out of the water. That, in my opinion, gives Jesus and God the most glory. Confessing when you can't do it. When you must have a Savior, when you realize that you are so lost that you can't do it, that to me brings more glory to God compared to believing that what you are doing brings glory to God. Um, So I encourage you to study more about this topic of the glory of God. Um, I don't really have much more to say about that, but if you have any questions, like I said, Google it. You can shoot me a message. I'd love to talk with you. But as I said, the glory of God is a big topic in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name. No, that's actually Colossians 3. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That should be our focus. And let's pray that God will enable us to do that. Well, that God will help us to do that. He who began a good work in you will finish it. See you guys later.